Games. Gamers, Matt Lincoln here with your Gamer Goggles, Gamer-Goggles.com, and today we have another flip through for you. This is on Pathfinder's Adventure Path for Curse of the Crimson Thrones. Uh, this is the revised edition that they just released, oh, I don't know, a couple months ago. Took me a little bit to get through it. Um, I have never played through the adventure, so I did a little bit of research to find out some of the things they changed, and I'm going to try and do this in a way that I do not spoil the adventure for those of you that haven't played. So, <clears throat> um, actually, I should back up and, well, no, maybe I, maybe I don't need to back up. Uh, I was going to give you a, a brief synopsis of the story. I don't know if that's important. We know that the story involves Scarwall. Um, well, here we go. You can, this is the premise of the story. And we'll zoom in and I'll just read a sentence or two to give you an idea. Uh, Corvosa, the jewel of Varicia, has long sparkled on the shore of Conqueror's Bay, established just over 300 years ago by the Chelyaks. And basically, the Curse of the Crimson Throne is a story, uh, well, they say it the best, the, curse, the Crimson Throne is not a prize to be won, it is a curse. No monarch, monarch of Corvosa has, has died of old age, and none has produced an heir while ruling it. So that is the premise of the whole story, um, and uh, it's an adventure path, so the adventure path is for levels 1 through like 18-ish when you finish. Uh, and we're just going to flip through and we're going to talk about a couple things in the book. Uh, of course, being uh, an adventure path from Paizo, well, I thought there was another page here, uh, they have the little brief overview, uh, the campaign setting, which they, get, they go into a little bit more detail, which... For those of you that aren't familiar with the story, this is where I would start if you're looking at buying the book. I would read through the campaign synopsis um, and some of the, the traits. Now, uh, if you're going to play it, well, then I wouldn't read it at all because I'm big on not having things spoiled. Uh, and then we're just going to, like I said, we're going to flip through. Um, the Edge of Anarchy is pretty much the first portion of the um, adventure. Now, you know, one thing I didn't pay enough attention to when I was reading through it and flipping through I do like the story a lot. Um, I didn't notice if they tell you uh, when they level, you should level your character, your players up, uh, like they did in Curse, uh, Curse, uh, Rise of the Rune Lords. I really like that, that they did that. Now, there are a few differences between uh, this and the original. Um, a couple of those differences are Castle Scarwall has a new method to uh, reveal its tragic history. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about that for now because, well, like I said, I'm not big on spoiling it. Uh, then in Chapter 4, when we get that far, I'm, I'm just going to kind of flip through. There's, you know, they, they have these little portfol portfolios, these little portraits of the key characters as they turn up in the story. Uh, sometimes they are important. Um, as a whole... I think that the uh, revised version, because I, like I said, I did some research. I looked at the uh, older version and um, the way it was released. Okay, so now you have the revised version as one big book, and you have all the adventures together in one place. Uh, the the way it was originally released was the traditional module esque type of setting where you get okay, this is uh, you get the first four adventures basically. So you get like. Chapter 1, Chapter 2, Chapter 3, Chapter 4. Those are all different modules, let's say. I don't actually have them committed to memory. I'd have to do some uh, digging and give you that information. Uh, but <clears throat> what is uh, crucial about it this way is I, I think it encourages more sandboxing. It gives the GM or the Dungeon Master, if you prefer, uh, more information. or Not so much more information, but it gives you a bigger collaborative of everything that is going on in the setting so you can make plans and if your players want to go off on a little bit of a sidetrack I think with the adventure setting books the whole the whole adventure path in one I think that makes it a little bit easier um, this is probably my favorite picture out of the whole book believe it or not the undead owlbear uh, and then in chapter four I mean because you know a lot of this is going to be looking at the adventures in just the pictures, but in chapter 4, one of the significant differences is that uh, players uh, can take on uh, the Grey Mantis, or the Grey, the Grey Maidens, 
and the Red Mantis now, which uh, the way I understand from my, my research was that that was a lot harder to do in the original Adventure Path. So they give you more information on the uh, Grey Maidens and the Red Mantis in the Cur Curse of the Crimson Throne Adventure Path. Now, as you where, where is a good... I want... Here, actually, let's just cheat. We're going to cheat here for a second because I want you to get a look at some of the maps. Uh, we'll go to page 45. Or, no, I like the sound of the dead warren. So we'll go to 58. Oh, I was already there. And we'll zoom in to give you guys an idea of the quality of the maps you get. Now, if you buy this in tandem with the PDF, you will uh, also get handouts uh, that, that are talked about throughout the book. Um, and, well, obviously printable maps and things of that nature. So you can draw on them and change them up. Uh, I didn't check, and I probably should have, to see if there was a player's guide for this adventure path. I'm sure there is. Um, and then, also, the one thing that I came across is, and, and I can't speak from first-hand experience with this because I've never, I haven't played it. I've only read it. Uh, but the events in Curse of the Crimson Throne seem to flow more fluently now so that it's easier to tell the story whereas before it was a little bit more discombobulated um and in the back of course i mean one of the key things i think to that pathfinder does or paizo does for their adventure path is oh wow i forgot i should talk about that a little bit um is they they have several appendixes or appendix I. Appendixes? Appendix I? It's one of the two. Uh, and that is, I think, crucial in this type of uh, storyline. Um, because, well, it just gives you extra information. It kind of organizes things all in the same place. Like, uh, the first part is on continuing the campaign. But here you go. Here's a great map of Corvosa itself, the city. It gives you an idea of how large the city is. There's all different kinds of points within the city. Um, and then there's a breakdown on the other page of the different taverns and uh, sites of interest, etc. Uh, it rumors, rumors, and you know, if you're a GM like me, you love rumors, right? Rumors are things that kind of can be red herrings for your players, or maybe your. I love to use rumors uh, when a player doesn't show up, and you kind of want everybody there for the main part of the story. So you can do like a little one-shot. Uh, that's not really how I, I envision one-shots, but uh, one-shots for me are usually one player and one GM type of thing. Uh, and then you have uh, Corvosa, and, oh, Corvosa and Beyond, I already said that part. Uh, and then you have the Harrow, which I don't know if you guys are aware of what the Harrow is in uh, Pathfinder, but it is, where is it? Let me get there. The Harrow. Uh, it, it's basically a tarot deck. Uh, in Right here, the, they have the rules for divining with the Harrow deck and everything you need to know. And then they have a breakdown of all the different cards. Uh, and I think, I want to say that they've actually made this. I should have researched that beforehand. Check the comments below. I'm sure somebody will say something about it uh, if they have. And I will try and remember after editing to get it posted. Uh, if they, they have, so you're aware of it. But I'm pretty sure this is in print. Uh, keep in mind, when was this originally printed? I, I don't know if that's in the beginning. I usually try and say that. So this is... I don't see the copyright information. Hmm. And am I on the wrong page? Well, I don't see it, so it's eluding me, and that that's okay. Also, in the back uh, is in the fourth one, Blood and Pain. Uh, Blood and Pain is, well, this, this is about the diseases that affect uh, Corvosa. Pri pri well, primarily Corvosa, but are, that are influenced within the storyline. We'll leave it at that. Uh, but 
and then equipment and magic that was originally debuted in the rise I'm running Rise of the Rune Lords, that's why I keep saying it. Uh, Curse of the Crimson Throne. Uh, and these are, you know, these are in some ways kind of dated. And you can see some of the uh, Dungeons and Dragons 3.5 influence in them. Uh, so if you're just getting into Pathfinder, you might look at some of this stuff uh, and be like, huh, it seems like magic is a little bit more broken. Uh, you, that might be the case. Magic is pretty broken in my opinion everywhere you go within role playing. Uh, so there's, you know, nothing super special about that. But uh, some of these uh, items are really cool. Like the third eye is basically uh, an eye in your hand through magic. It's kind of neat. Uh, it allows you to do clairvoyance and clairaudience. Uh, and then, well, the NPC codex. Uh, oh, look at that guy. Oh, he looks like he's pretty tough. He's a Rakshasha. Rakshasa. I, I uh, am not good with that. Um, and he's basically in the Pathfinder Bestiary. Uh, he's a medium outsider. And he's uh, about what? He's an 8th level rogue? Yeah. So you can imagine uh, how fun he is to play with. And there's a few other... NPCs back here. Blackjack. That's probably my second favorite picture, which I'm not sure how well you can see that in this light. There we go. Uh, he's clearly a rogue, right? Ha! I lied. He's a vigilante. And uh, that, that's really pretty much the summation of it. So... What do I think of Curse of the Crimson Throne? Well, if you want to learn more about the area of Corvosa or play and get involved with the possible interpretations of the Grey Maidens and Red Mantis, that uh, rather than just the illusions that you might have, um, this is a really good book for that. Uh, the storyline in and of itself is, of course, solid. It is a classic adventure. So if you want to go back to almost the beginning of Paizo's time, uh, when well, like when they first started, this is a good way to get to know the company. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm being elusive, elusive here because I don't want to give away the premise of the story. I just want to highlight some of the things that they did to bring it up to date. Uh, and again, that was they created a better way to reveal the tragic history of Scarwall. Um, and then in Chapter 4, that allows the players to possibly take on the Grey Maidens and or the Red Mantis. And they organized the events so that they have smoother flow. Uh, and, and by condensing it into one book and doing the things they did, I think they create a better sandbox. So... Maybe your players don't like where the story is going and they like the area. So after playing through the first four levels, you use this as a reference guide for sandboxing your own adventure. Um, after I finish Rise of the Rune Lords, I hope to play through this and run it um, and give you a follow-up uh, review as to how it went GMing it. Uh, the forums are full of advice on how to GM this and give you all kinds of GM tips. Uh, so thanks for watching guys have a great day and uh, my next Pathfinder review should be on bestiary 6 just to let you know thanks for watching and have a great day